from a rectangular slab of ice that divided the internet in 2018, and these pretzel-shaped trees in northern Europe that nobody can explain, to a massive crater in southern Siberia that may or may not be cursed, and mysterious volcanic lightning that's left experts scratching their heads, here are 10 natural phenomena that science can't explain. Now, everyone agrees that a comet wiped out the dinosaurs about 66 million years ago. A more recent, hypothetical impact currently has scientists split. Did a wayward comet kickstart civilization as we know it, or is there another explanation? The Younger Dryas period was a brief ice age between 12,900 and 11,700 years ago. What's baffling is it seemed to occur out of nowhere. At the time, the Earth was shifting from a glacial climate to a warmer, more inhabitable one. Then, temperatures in the northern hemisphere dropped radically, returning the planet to near-glacial conditions. The Younger Dryas ended almost as quickly as it began. In Greenland, temperatures rose 18 degrees Fahrenheit in a decade. While science agrees that the Younger Dryas was real, they can't agree on how it began and why it ended so suddenly. The mainstream theory is that the North American ice sheet was already melting. All that fresh water flowed into the ocean, which caused the slowdown or total shutdown of the North Atlantic conveyor. This ocean conveyor helps circulate warm tropical waters north. However, rapidly melting glaciers would hinder that process, leading to a colder climate. An alternative theory suggests something more catastrophic. If you're a fan of Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson, then you have definitely heard of the Younger Dryas Impact Theory. In short, the theory suggests that between 13,000 and 9,000 years ago, multiple comet fragments struck all over Earth. The impacts generated an enormous heat wave that melted the northern ice caps. The melting ice caused widespread flooding and left our planet as it is today. It may have also wiped out a long-lost civilization, something far more advanced than the hunter-gatherers we learned about in school. There's about 24 cumulative hours worth of Hancock and Carlson explaining impact theory on the Joe Rogan experience. If you want to learn more, we suggest hitting your local dispensary, kicking back, and keeping an open mind. If you venture into the remote forests of southeastern Siberia, you'll stumble upon a strange rock formation that science can't explain. A few think it's the site of Stalin-era nuclear testing. Some scientists blame underground volcanic activity, while others point to the sky, claiming a meteor must have struck the area. They're arguing over what's called the Potomsky Crater, a mysterious mound of shattered limestone deep in the Potom Highlands. It measures 520 feet wide by 130 feet tall. Inside the crater is another mound of rock measuring 39 feet tall. In total, the crater consists of 8.8 .8 million cubic feet of limestone and weighs roughly 1 million tons. And still, nobody knows how it got there. Researchers believe the crater is about 300 years old, ruling out the Stalin nuclear theory. For the longest time, people believed a meteor crashed into Earth and opened a giant gas pocket. They tried linking the crater to the Tunguska event in 1908, but the dates didn't match up. The crater was proven to be much older. The meteor theory was officially rejected in 2010. In 2015, scientists suggested that magma could have caused steam to build under the rock. This may have triggered a massive explosion that formed the crater. The only problem with this theory is that there are no signs of volcanic activity in the area. The indigenous population believes the area is cursed. They claim illness and death follow all who venture too close to the crater. The curse theory gained traction when geologist Eugenie Vorobyov died of a freak heart attack while visiting Potomsky in 2005. Since then, many researchers have visited the crater and lived to tell the tale. While they still don't know how it got there, they can confidently say it's not cursed. The barren grasslands of Africa's Namib Desert have been puzzling scientists for a long time. That's because they are covered in circles. Fairy circles, not to be confused with crop circles, are round patches of barren land amid a sea of arid grass. They can grow between 7 and 39 feet across, but don't follow any kind of pattern, unlike crop circles. 
The name comes from a natural phenomenon called fairy rings, when mushrooms grow in a circle to form a ring on the ground. Fairy circles are different because it's like someone stamped the circle into the grass. For the longest time, scientists thought these circles only occurred in southeastern Africa and Australia's Pilbara region. It turns out that fairy circles can be found all over the world. You just have to know where to look. So we know what they are, and we know where to find them. We just don't know for sure how fairy circles form. Many theories have fallen out of favor over the years. Right now, there are only two that modern science likes. The first theory suggests that the grass self-organizes into these circles. Somehow, it uses the circular gap as a water resource. Forming these geometric shapes helps the grass survive in arid climates like Africa and Australia. The second and more interesting theory involves competing colonies of underground sand termites. It's believed they build these circles by chewing through the grass roots to form a water reservoir. In fact, one researcher believes these circles are the roofs of underground termite cities. If that's true, you should probably avoid walking on them. That's one roof you wouldn't want to fall through. Lightning is amazing. Volcanic eruptions are a sight to behold. Put them together, and you get one of Mother Nature's coolest spectacles, volcanic lightning. But while we know volcanic lightning exists, the scientific jury is still out on why it exists. We know that volcanic lightning works like normal lightning storms. Static electricity builds until the energy pops in the form of a lightning bolt. What we don't understand is how that static builds inside a volcanic plume in the first place. One explanation is what's called frictional charging. It's when rock fragments and ash particles collide in midair and create charged ions. Some are positively charged, some are negatively charged. When they come near each other, a bolt of static electricity shoots between them. Ice charging is a similar mechanic and is more closely related to how thunderstorms work. As the plume rises, warm air mixes with cold air in the upper atmosphere. Water in the plume freezes, and those ice particles collide, causing lightning. That's why plume height also matters. Tall plumes carry more water into colder parts of the atmosphere. They freeze, collide, and trigger larger bolts of volcanic lightning. Fun fact, the earliest written record of volcanic lightning comes from Pliny the Younger, as he watched Mount Vesuvius erupt in 79 AD. He described it as an intense darkness rendered more appalling by the fitful gleam of torches at intervals obscured by the transient blaze of lightning. Sadly, his uncle, Pliny the Elder, perished in the eruption while trying to rescue his friend. Volcanic lightning was one of the last things he ever saw. In October of 2018, NASA tweeted a very strange picture. It looked like a perfectly square piece of ice, as if machines had cut it from an ice field. Some commenters said it proved we were living in a simulation. Others blamed aliens. A few just thought it was photoshopped. To their dismay, the ice slab was very real. NASA spotted the phenomenon during a routine aerial survey of the Antarctic Peninsula. The survey was part of Operation Ice Bridge, a research project created to learn more about how the poles influence Earth's climate. NASA's tweet read, The iceberg's sharp angles and flat surface indicate that it recently calved from the ice shelf. But we've seen calving videos before, especially if you follow this channel. They don't break into even pieces. It's more like a chaotic landslide of ice falling into the ocean. So how did this iceberg, estimated to be 130 feet tall and between 1 and 2 miles long, form so perfectly? According to National Geographic, the rectangle broke off from the Larsen Sea ice shelf on the east coast of the Antarctic Peninsula. Because Larsen Sea is so massive, the ice can spread out and become flat. When an iceberg breaks off, it is not uncommon for it to look like a perfect rectangle. It's also very cold in Antarctica, which leads to bigger icebergs. You'd never see something like this in Greenland, for example. The warmer climate causes ice to calve in small, sloppy pieces. One scientist compared it to fingernails to explain why it's perfectly rectangular. Ice sheets grow pretty evenly. Fissures form when they get too long, and they break from the main ice sheet. That's why they're often geometric. Regardless, it seems a little bit too perfect if you ask us. The 
The Mekong River is a 3,000-mile waterway in Southeast Asia. It's the 12th longest river in the world and the third longest on the Asian continent. A long stretch of the Mekong actually marks the border between northeastern Thailand and western Laos. Every year, Thai people gather along a 155-mile stretch of the Mekong in Nong Khai province. They've come to watch something science can't explain – fireballs rising from the water and floating into the air. They're called Naga fireballs. They're basically glowing orbs that rise from the water and float several hundred feet toward the sky. You'll typically see hundreds if not thousands of them during the Naga Fireball Festival. The festival marks the end of Vasa, also known as Buddhist Lent. While science argues over what causes these fireballs, the locals have a more mythical explanation. They believe the fireballs come from the breaths of a giant sea serpent called Phaya Naga, or simply Naga. That's where the name comes from. Phaya Naga lives in the Mekong riverbed and awakens at the end of Buddhist Lent. Of course, science doesn't believe in sea serpents and mythical creatures. One of the leading theories is that these fireballs form due to underwater decomposition. A mixture of CO2, methane, and hydrogen sulfide forms and rises like a bubble. When it reaches the surface, it reacts with the oxygen-rich air, causing this ball of fire effect. Still, it's just a theory, and while it may make some sense, the fire-breathing serpent living in the river is a much better story. A narrow strip of land in northern Europe has beachgoers and scientists equally baffled. It's called the Dancing Forest, where the trees look more like pretzels. It's part of the Coronian Spit National Park, situated between the Baltic Sea and the Coronian Lagoon. It's technically part of the Kaliningrad Oblast, a detached Russian state between Poland and Lithuania. Twisted trees aside, the geological features of the area are highly unusual. The Koronian Spit is a narrow, 60-mile landmass connecting Latvia and Russia like a piece of spaghetti. Scientists believe glacial deposits and moving dunes formed the spit. The soil is porous and has a high clay concentration. All those features might combine to form a unique ecosystem, but it doesn't explain why the trees are all knotted up. While the Koronian Spit formed over centuries, the Dancing Forest is fairly young. All the trees were planted sometime in the 1960s to stabilize the dunes. They began as tiny buds and grew into fun shapes and sizes. One theory is that wind, soil instability, and the tree's genetic makeup caused them to twist and turn. Other theories suggest seismic activity has something to do with it. The leading theory blames an insect called the pine shoot moth. Their caterpillars love to eat the apical buds of plants. The apical bud is the very top of the plant. It basically determines the plant's growth habit and overall form. When they're eaten, the plants begin growing at odd, unnatural angles. But because plants naturally grow toward the sun, they eventually correct and grow normally. Between 1980 and 1981, NASA scientists noticed something strange on top of Saturn. Voyager 1 and 2 captured an odd hexagonal jet stream encircling the planet's North Pole. Back on Earth, they weren't sure what they were looking at. They'd also have to wait two years to look again. In 2004, when the Cassini-Huygens went to study Saturn, it found the planet in the middle of a long winter. You see, one year on Saturn equals 29 years on Earth. And like Earth, Saturn experiences different seasons. They just last seven years each. That means Cassini couldn't just wait a few months for winter to end. Thankfully, NASA had another trick up its sleeve. A visual and infrared mapping spectrometer, or a VIMS, allowed Cassini to see through Saturn's winter. NASA could see the hexagonal shape again. The question became, what the heck is it? According to NASA, it's a perfectly hexagonal jet stream. It stretches roughly 20,000 miles across and has winds blowing at 300 miles per hour. For the record, Earth is just under 25,000 miles around. So to put this jet stream in perspective, take a Category 5 hurricane, double its speed, 
and let it hold Earth like an ice cream cone. The entire thing spins around a tight vortex, which marks Saturn's North Pole. One VIMS scientist called the vortex one of the biggest mysteries of the dynamics of Saturn. On Earth, jet streams meander through the atmosphere because our planet's surface isn't uniform. We have oceans, mountains, and land that prevents shapes from forming. Saturn, on the other hand, is a giant gas bubble. Its uniform composition allows for this hexagonal shape to form. In fact, scientists were able to recreate the hexagon under controlled conditions. The storm continues to mystify scientists to this day. They've recently noticed it changing colors and believe it has something to do with the planet's seasons. On September 8th of 2017, an 8.1 magnitude earthquake struck near Mexico City. Videos from the earthquake went viral as people claimed to see strange lights. These so-called earthquake lights were nothing new. They've actually had scientists arguing for hundreds of years. There's evidence of people studying earthquake lights as far back as the 1600s. Those who have researched them claim they come in many different shapes, forms, and colors. Unfortunately, people's competing descriptions makes it hard to pinpoint what's happening. The US Geological Survey is skeptical that they even exist. Many reports have turned out to be downed power lines or exploding transformers. One plausible explanation is that earthquake lights are caused by electric charges activated in certain rocks during seismic activity. It's like turning on a battery within the Earth's crust. The problem with studying earthquake lights is their unpredictability. They only occur in 0.5% of earthquakes. You'd have to know an earthquake was coming and be close enough to see the lights. And even then, you only have a 0.5% chance it's happening. Limited studies have suggested that earthquake lights should be treated as warnings. There have been many reports of earthquake lights in the hours, days, and weeks leading up to a major event. According to a geologist with the Quebec Ministry of Natural Resources, if you see visible lights in the sky and you live in an earthquake-prone area, they might be an early warning sign that an earthquake is approaching. Your friends might think you're crazy, but it's better to be safe than sorry. There's something in the air in Taos, New Mexico. This small artsy community is famous for an unexplainable humming in the air. Locals know it as the Taos hum. The hum was first reported in the early 1990s. An engineering professor at the University of New Mexico found that 2% of the population could hear it. They were deemed hearers, and further testing was carried out to find abnormalities in their homes. Nothing unusual was ever detected. Research revealed that not everybody heard the same thing. Some called it a whir, while others called it a hum or a buzz. The musically inclined said it was more like a constant E flat. The fact that people were hearing different things was puzzling. Could they be reporting subjective experiences rather than objective sounds? Now we still don't know why 2% of the Taos population hears this hum. One theory suggests it's an auditory hallucination. That theory is backed by the fact that some people still hear the hum even after leaving Taos. It may not be an external sound either. Did you know that your ears can make their own noises? They're called autoacoustic emissions, or OAEs. They're echoes in your ear that you wouldn't hear normally. But don't confuse OAEs with tinnitus, they're different. In the absence of hard science, people often turn to conspiracy. The Taos hum has been blamed on everything from the CIA to paranormal activity. Taos, New Mexico isn't alone either. About 4% of the global population can hear the hum. Can you? If you enjoyed this video and want to see another just like it, be sure to click the link on screen now. With that, thanks for watching and be sure to tune in next time.